Read the last sentence, Melissa. Last sentence of Section 4 of the 14th Amendment. Oh, you don't have it. Oh. All right, Marie, read, read Section 4 of the 14th Amendment, last section. Yeah, the, just the last sentence. It says, but neither. It's on the bottom of page 49. Yeah, section 4 of the 14th Amendment. Neither the United States nor any state shall assume or pay any debt or obligation incurred in aid of, of insurrection or rebellion against the United States or any claim for the law for emancipation. Ah, what does that say? Melissa? Congress doesn't have to pay when they take their state. Okay, so this is like, no one even knows this. I found this out, like, like, like three people have actually written on this. Congress effectively nullified any takings claims for slaves. They said, we will not pay any compensation for any emancipation of slaves. That covers the Emancipation Proclamation, and that covers the 13th Amendment. So all the slave freed as well as the Civil War, the masters would not get compensation. Why was this added? Because I actually looked this up. You had southern plantation owners who just lost the Civil War, and they actually went to federal court and were saying, hey, government, you took my slave away. Pay me compensation for it. These, these cases were actually happening. And can you imagine, can you imagine what actually has to happen for a court to actually grant that as a taking? They would have to reaffirm Dred Scott and that these people were property. And the, the, the hard part of that is, is at before the 14th Amendment, Lincoln freed the slaves on the premise they were property. Right? This is the part we don't like talking about. The entire Emancipation Proclamation was premised on the fact that these were property. I am seizing them as my war power, and I am letting them go. So in order for a court to find that there was no taking, they would have to first say that Lincoln was right and they were property in the first place. So that's the only way they could emancipate the slaves. So they buried this little provision in into Section 4 of the 14th Amendment, which no one actually read. I mean, maybe like two people. But it's in there. So there are no takings claims for slaves. Answer your question? Yeah. Yeah. Supreme Court already decided on the two cases that were decided like two days ago. Which case are we talking about? Um, one is about the case we signed for today. No, no, no. It was the current, current right now in the Supreme Court. It's supposed to decide on two, uh, two cases about money given to the politics. Oh, Supreme Court hasn't decided any cases. That's the McCutcheon case you're asking about. Yeah, it's the current. That case. hasn't been decided yet. No. So you didn't know if they were. So, so just a warning. So Supreme Court usually releases opinions at 10 Eastern, which is 9 local. So in any days from the Supreme Court in session, I will give you an immediate review because I'll it'll be on my mind. So uh, we haven't actually had any yet. So if any Monday or Wednesday opinion day is coming up, you'll, you'll get it first here. Just I'm warning you. You, you don't have a choice. Uh, it was actually really funny. I used to teach a class for the judge I clerk for. And uh, Citizens United, this big campaign finance case, was decided at 10 a.m. And we had class like at 1 so I was furiously reading the entire opinion. It's like 130 pages. And I had just finished reading it. And Judge was like, okay, Josh, talk about the case. And I had to decide three hours earlier, so then I learned my lesson. So I'm always going to be talking about the cases when classes start. It was a long opinion, too. All right. All right. Any other questions? Yeah. I don't watch The Daily Show. I don't, I don't watch TV in general, but... Uh, Napolitano, yep. Oh, uh, what were you saying about Napolitano's not a Lincoln fan? This is like the dumbest thing ever. Like, what did he say? He said like that uh, Lincoln <laughs> like basically started the Civil War and shed like and basically killed a bunch of Americans um, and everything, and that slavery was dying out by itself, and he didn't need to do that, and that he could have bought all the slaves, um, like for like three billion or something, right? I'm not sure for the number I gave before. Yeah. I, I didn't watch any of you. I don't know. Before even like going into war or anything. So so dying. so when you want to um let's let's actually put this in context. We're talking about Lincoln, right? We talk a lot about Lincoln and Dred Scott, where Lincoln simply said, "I'm going to ignore Dred Scott, even though the Supreme Court is the final arbiter of the Constitution. I will, in my own independent judgment, say Dred Scott is wrong." And some of the people in this room said, "No big deal, right? That's fine, right?" It's no problem when people judge the Constitution for themselves to decide we have to follow the Supreme Court. Keep that same image in mind when we get to Brown and where governors throughout the South said, you know what? Brown was wrong. That's not what the Constitution means. And I'm going to ignore it. In the same sense in which Lincoln ignored the Constitution and the Supreme Court, I should say the Constitution as interpreted by the Supreme Court, 
Lots of people on the South interpreted it. And keep in your mind, why is one right and the other wrong? Now you can say, oh, of course, Dred Scott is correct and Brown is, I mean, Dred Scott is wrong and Brown is correct, right? Yeah, of course. Well, those are easy cases, right? And a lot of cases that aren't so easy to decide what's right and wrong. And when we delegate the decision to decide constitutionality to someone not the Supreme Court, it makes for a lot of fuzzy situations. And we'll do this post-Brown, okay? All right, questions on anything else before we go to the case of today? Spare. Yeah. The problem is when I go to the dry cleaners, it's actually funny. When I, I always leave these in my pocket when I go to the dry cleaners. I was like, oh, it's your passport. I'm like, no, not a passport, but, but close. <laughs> anyway, anything else? Okay. So let's talk about the cases for today. Um, I'm positive that everyone's actually heard of Brown. I'm also positive they've never heard of the other case that came before it. And I, I, I'm, I'm virtually certain, right? And the reason why I like to do the cases in this sequence is it shows kind of this circuitous path from Plessy to Brown, right? It, it's just not a straight line. And the Supreme Court had to take many different meanderings, right? So we have the cases, okay? So first we have, in the chronology, the civil rights cases, okay? These are the cases that say that the Supreme Court, um, uh, you know, can't, uh, I'm sorry, that Congress can't, through the Civil Rights Act, desegregate private facilities, right? That, that, that the... Um, that the decision to have segregated facilities is for private individuals and Congress can act there, okay? And then we have Plessy versus Ferguson, which effectively says that as long as equal accommodations are being made, even if they're separate, that that satisfies the 14th Amendment. Those two decisions, one, two, pave the way for Jim Crow, okay? Once you tell southern states that, A, as long as you provide separate facilities, you're okay, and B, private companies can, can uh, discriminate in uh, 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 hotels and restaurants, whatever, there's not much stopping the ability of Jim Crow from running rampant, okay? But that was just the start. Those cases dealt with what we might call uh, uh, accommodation laws, like trains and railroads and, uh, uh, you know, places of public conveyance. But the next aspects of Jim Crow were to fully and entirely separate the blacks from the whites in every sense of the word, right? And they did this in a couple contexts. Voting, public education, jury service, not with sounding strata, right? These core elements of how a person can be part of a civil society were, were separated. And what's interesting, though, is that each of these three cases, the, uh, the, the, the Cumming versus Board of Education, the, the Giles versus Harris, and the Berea College versus Kentucky case, if you notice, the court was very deliberate in all those cases. They didn't touch the constitutional issue, right? They danced around it. They, they actually did a little dance. And they tried to resolve it in a very indirect way. Now you might ask, why did they resolve this in an indirect way? You can look at this a couple different ways and we'll never know the heart, the true history. Perhaps the, the most, you know, narrow way of reading it is that, well, they only had to resolve a very specific issue. They weren't recalled on to overturn Plessy versus Ferguson, right? But I think a better answer is they realized full well that they couldn't eliminate segregation they realized very well that if they were to issue an opinion saying that the state of Georgia in the year 19 or whatever had to um, uh, desegregate their, I'm sorry, integrate their schools, Georgia would have ignored it, right? They realized that they ordered Alabama to give the, the franchise to, 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 to black men. They would have ignored it. They realized that if they'd ordered Kentucky to, you know, desegregate schools, they would have ignored it. And not only have they ignored it, I talked to a few people about this after class yesterday, there would have been massive, violent, widespread opposition, right? We're not just talking about cases. We're talking about people with hoods and torches, okay? This is not, and you see what I'm getting at, this is not a joke. The time in which we were deciding these cases was very volatile. Okay? The entire South was a tinderbox waiting to blow. And it, it's very easy for us to read these decisions 90 years later in hindsight. But at the time, 
the judges know full well that whatever they write would be ignored. Right? Which which raises the question I think I asked you in the very first day of class, right? Why do why does anyone listen to a court? Right? Where is their army? What do they have to enforce it? The answer is not much. I'm jumping ahead a little bit. But did Brown versus Board of Education force black students into schools? The answer is absolutely not. What forced black students into schools? Guns. Little Rock Nine in Arkansas. This was uh, 1957, so uh, uh, about uh, two years after Brown. Arkansas said, we will not listen to the Supreme Court. The Supreme Court's wrong. What happened? The President of the United States mobilized the National Guard to give a military escort into the school. It wasn't the Supreme Court that got these kids into school. It was the President of the United States and guns. Another famous image, which I'm sure many of you have seen, this is 1963, Governor George Wallace of Alabama. Anyone from Tuscaloosa? Roll Tide? Well, we don't say why it's called a Crimson Tide, but that was a direct reference to the Confederacy, right? It says Roll Tide now, it's not a toilet paper thing, right? The, the tree is right. So what happened? Governor Orwell Faubus, I'm sorry, not Faubus, uh, Governor George Wallace said segregation now and segregation forever. He ran for president on that platform. He stood in the door to prevent black students from entering the University of Alabama in Tuscaloosa. What stopped him? President Kennedy. Remember that thing in the Constitution which says that the president's commander-in-chief of the state militias? He basically federalized the Alabama National Guard. And he said, General, the Alabama National Guard, you are no longer loyal to the governor. You're working for me now. And you go and get in the hell out of that doorway. This is a real photograph. This, this actually happened. right? Brown didn't do this at least by itself. It was important. But it took a president of the United States to send an armed guard against a governor of a state to tell him to get the hell out of the doorway. Right? I'll show you another picture. There was another case called Palmer versus Thompson. This was a case, I think, Jacksonville, Florida. Supreme Court had a case that says, uh, there was, in somewhere in Jacksonville, they had a segregated swimming pool that, that blacks could not go into the swimming pool. Okay? Supreme Court said, you can't have segregated swimming pools. So what did Jacksonville do? They filled it with cement. Rather than desegregate the, the swimming pool, they filled it with cement and closed it. That's it. That's actually the, that's actually a swimming pool in Florida. A guy took some pictures sent them to me. And you see the diving board there. You can kind of see the you know life emerging from the cement, which is kind of poetic. But the they they closed it. What did Virginia schools do? It's Brown said Virginia schools you must desegregate. What did they do? They shut down schools. In areas of Virginia, they shut down entire school districts. You have an entire generation of people in Virginia who had no schools, white or black. Think about that. They would rather have the white kids have no school than have integrated schools. Although, what people don't talk about is, they would give tax credits to certain people to go to a private school. Oh. All right. So, some people have to go to school. Same thing in Little Rock. This is with uh, Little Rock, Arkansas. I actually read an article once. There was an entire group of high school seniors at this high school who never graduated because the school shut down. And they never, they never walked. They never graduated. You know, they went out with their lives, but they, they never got their diplomas. They, it was a, kind of a sad thing. So when we talk about the legitimacy of the courts and why courts rule, why courts don't rule. So this happened in 19, was it 60, uh, 1957. Imagine if the court in, let's say, the Berea College case in, you know, 1908, whatever it is, or the Cummings case in, in 1899 had ordered the schools of, you know, Georgia to integrate, there would have been another civil war. And I don't put this mildly. There would have been a, a, a riot and lots of people have gotten killed. There's no, there's no doubt about that. We can even debate whether the country was ready for this in 1955 with Brown, or 1952 with Brown. Some people say no. We had this happen, right? The issue of whether the court moves too far out of the people is always a lingering issue. I mean, this is, if you want to bring it to contemporary debates, the issue of gay marriage, right? Is, could the court have said, I don't know, 15 years ago, that the state of Texas can't discriminate against gays with respect to marriage? What about 10 years ago? What about five years ago? What about last year? 
What about two years from now? Society moves at various paces, and it's always a concern when you move too far, too fast, you leave people behind. Um, perhaps the greatest example of this backlash is abortion and Roe v. Wade. We'll talk about it a lot. If you actually look at the trends, and not to, not to take Judge Napolitano's line on, in the 60s and 70s, abortion was becoming very legal in almost every state. This might be a shock to you, but evangelicals really had no position on abortion. This wasn't even a big Christian issue. The galvanizing force that made abortion the tinderbox yesterday was Roe. Because at that point, it had been legal in almost every state. But because of that, it galvanized this massive backlash that basically gave rise to the Christian majority and the evangelicals. And even now, 40 years after Roe, people are still fighting over this tooth and nail. Even in Texas, we have all these new laws discussing abortion. So there's always this risk when the courts move too far out of line with the mainstream that there might be a, what we call a, a kickback or a blowback against the people. And the Brown Court tried as hard as they could to avoid this, right? How did they do this? First, they made, they made it unanimous. And you've read the notes, you'll see this, I'll talk about this later, but they worked so hard to get this unanimous and there's no dissent, right? What else did they do? They made the opinion so narrow. I'm sure a lot of you were very underwhelmed when you read this case. It's like only three pages, right? Like you're expecting this great magisterial thing like Plessy's dissent and in, in, in Harlan's dissent in Plessy. It's a fairly innocuous opinion. It doesn't really say that much. It doesn't even overrule Plessy. In fact, it's so limited, all it affects is public education. That's it. The opinion itself is fairly narrow. And that was deliberate. They didn't want to decide anything more than they had to. They even had Brown 2, that, you know, sequel. You know, Brown Strikes Back, where, you know, they had to <laughs> litigate all the other issues that were not resolved, rather than the Godfather Part 2. But, you know, it's, you know it, was, it was, they had to come back. They didn't want to do everything in one case. They wanted to stretch it out over a couple years to give people time to accept it, right? Did Brown order desegregation immediately? No. It said with, quote, all deliberate speed, all deliberate speed. That's this quote which uh, we, we hear all the time. What does it mean, all deliberate speed? Well, it, that means like 30 years. And I'm not being facetious. There actually are um, orders stemming from the Brown litigation that are still open. Some schools in Louisiana and Mississippi are still under orders enacted by Brown courts. This is this is not like you know this was not like a, a, a short a short deal. Okay. So you have to keep all these issues in mind of why and how the court got to where they got and why they decided to uh, uh, avoid resolving this issue broadly. Okay. Any issues about the broad meta sense? Okay. Uh, to answer the question, add them now, and if they don't come, that's fine, but it gives me a better head count. I'd rather have more than less. Uh, so, yes, yeah, just add whoever family members want to come, and this way I have a good head count. Any tickets I don't use, I can give back at no charge, so there's no penalty. Uh, and as far as the state police power, yeah. And actually, one of the more odd arguments, you know, the police power is a self, self uh, wealth, health, safety, welfare, and morals, right, of the people. They actually cited safety, and how's that? They said if they integrated schools, it would be massive violence. That if they integrated rail cars, it would be massive violence. That they were trying to protect the people from hurting themselves. Now, you might say that's a disingenuous thing, but if you look at this picture, there's a reason why those guys have guns, right? There's a reason why these people couldn't walk to school by themselves, because they would have been killed, right? There were lynchings. This is not, this happened. People would be killed on their way to work. Right. By the way, if you want to research a fasting period, the right to bear arms and civil rights. I think I've mentioned this before, but the biggest proponents of gun control were segregationists because they wanted to make sure blacks were disarmed. It's a sordid history. And if you actually talk to most of the civil rights uh, uh, champions, they hold lots of guns because they have to protect themselves. It's a very important aspect of how they were able to fight back. I mean, it, you would have an armed guard outside Martin Luther King's house 24 hours a day. It, because they could not rely on the police, because the police were working with the uh, with the other guys, right? So, guns and race, very important thing. We don't talk about much. All right, we do the cases or any questions? Okay. So the first case, this is the this is the Cummings case. Let's see. Uh, all right, right there. So, uh, uh, Cody, what's 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 the uh, Cummings case? What happened there? Uh, they weren't. 
the high schools weren't uh, taxing the... Hey, you're on the right track. <laughs> but uh, <laughs> the words in the sentence were correct, but they're not in the right order. <laughs> the uh, high schools were taxing the... Uh, what was the problem? What, what was the problem here? They're objecting to. Um, it withdrew and denied to the colored school population any participation in the educational facilities of the high school system in the county. Okay, right. And voted to continue to deny to that population any admission to. Okay, don't read. Just, just tell me. They were, it, no, it, right here. In your own words. They were denying the um, blacks the ability to use the facilities. Which facility? The high school. Yes, 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 that's right. Yeah. Yeah. So I have a question. So they did have a high school for the color and they threw it away. Exactly. So 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 here's what happened. So as a threshold matter in the nineteenth century, in the eighteen hundreds, public education was rare. I know we think that oh yeah, public school is the most important aspect. Most states do not have public education. Almost all education is done through private institutions or religious, you know, churches, whatever. There, was very, there were very few public schools. So in Georgia, they actually had public schools, and following Plessy, they would have a set of schools for whites and set of schools for, for, for black people, okay? And at some point, they decided that they could no longer afford to maintain these separate schools, right? So they would continue taxing everyone to pay for high schools, but only white children would be eligible to the high school. Everyone get the facts? Okay. Chelsea, what was the government's argument about why they had to uh, why they had to shut down the uh, the black high school? Why couldn't they keep them both open? Yeah. Yeah. So th this is actually their argument. It's almost surreal, right? They said, if we maintain high school for sixty black children. We'd have to then withhold high, uh, education for 300 black children. In other words, <laughs> by giving a few black children a high school education, that money will be taken away from primary school education from black children. Everyone get the facts? Okay. Now, why you know the money could be taken away from the white children, or why you know perhaps they could raise taxes, have more education, whatever? That 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 was even an issue. All they said was that we can't afford to do this. They said that the decision was in the interest of the greatest number of colored children. That's better to give them a, you know, a, a primary school education than to give you know, fewer of them a high school education. Right? OK. So uh, Claire, was this order was this policy even valid under Plessy versus Ferguson? Even under separate but equal, was this valid, in your opinion? Yes. Why? There's no, there's, there's no equal, right? This is not even separate but equal. There's just separate, right? You have to have both of them. Not, you have to separate and equal. So even under Plessy, right, this wouldn't fly, right? Even under Plessy, this wouldn't be okay. Okay, but Murray, why did the court not resolve the Plessy issue? Why did they not consider the Fourteenth Amendment constitutional issue? Yeah, but no, no. But why? Why didn't they resolve the constitutional issue? Well, I know they avoided it, but why did they avoid it? That, that's the question. Anyone? Anyway, why did they avoid? It's for anyone. Why did they avoid the constitutional issue? Cheryl? Sure. I think he said it didn't even address it. it. It wasn't even an issue. That this closing down the school didn't deprive any person of life, liberty, or property, and so it didn't address the 14th Amendment. This was just about economic decisions that the state made. Mm. Is that right? Kind of Jenny, hand up. Uh, well, the thing I'm looking at here says that it doesn't even involve education, that it was just a transportation issue. Kind of. One more. Yeah? What, what do you think? Well, basically, I think. Uh, they were trying to establish a narrow ruling so they wouldn't have to bring up the constitutional issues and they could later use that narrow ruling to push the envelope. Okay. That is the policy reason why. But what's the legal reason why? Want to know what it was? Well, it said that um, it did not violate the interpretation of the amendment. 
Did the... It is not written for No, no, no. Was it that they had to issue an injunction, and in this case it wouldn't be proper? That's the next case. That's, that's, that's more the next case. That's coming versus board, right? Yeah. Because yeah. only provided for elementary education? No, no. Did the parties even raise this issue? The key thing is, and this is mentioned very subtly, they said plaintiffs do not challenge that provision, right? The plaintiffs here weren't stupid, right? The, 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 these, these people were not dumb. Do you think they were so bold as to challenge Plessy outright? Three, you know, three years after it was decided, right? This was 1899, like uh, six years after Plessy. Do you think they were going to go ahead and challenge Plessy outright? They conceded that separate but equal is valid. What they wanted was their separate and equal facility. Everyone see that? They wanted a separate black high school. That's what they wanted. I'm sure, I'm sure in their hearts they wanted an integrated high school, but there was a 0% chance of that happening. So they were trying to pick their battles. This is a lesson to learn. Civil rights is very gradual litigation. You pick your battles in a very deliberate, incremental fashion. So rather than saying, let's have Brown versus Board of Education in the year 1899, say, wait a minute, wait a minute. Let's at least get to separate schools, right? Let's at least get to separate schools. Everyone see that? Okay, so if that's the case, uh, Jacqueline, why did they lose? Why was a school able to have a white high school but not a black high school? What, what, what did the court hold? Pretty much, yeah. They said, we don't find any bad faith, right? There's nothing in the record to permit us to find any kind of discrimination. That this is a local school decision. They said this decision was in the great, was in the best interest of the greatest number of colored children. Okay. Even though everyone's paying these taxes and the burden's being spread, there's nothing wrong with them directing it. And it's funny to use it as an example. What happens if they open up a girl high school, right? Wouldn't that be okay? Would that be okay? Oh. So here thinks a state could open up an all-girl high school. Who thinks they can't? Okay, don't raise your hands. So that was actually a close question. Ask some of your parents who went to public school in the 50s if they were gendered. The answer is yes, right? I know my mom did. And even in New York, they had separate sex schools. That's no longer okay. But, but there was a lot of time where you actually had girl schools only, not just Catholic schools, but even all-girl public schools. All right? Let's see. Priscilla, who wrote the majority opinion in, in, in this case? Um, this is Harlan. My man, Harlan. All right. <laughs> so we had, some, we had some discussion with Justice Harlan on Plessy with his views towards blacks and views towards uh, Chinese people. What's, explain this one for my, 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 my man, Justice Harlan. What, what's going on here? Um, good question. <laughs> well, think about it. What did the court say here about Discrimination and the Fourteenth Amendment. Well, I mean, I can't. Well, there's no room for any discrimination here. There's like, there's a state action that like taking away the school is just something to do more with taxes. Does it have anything to do with like race or anything? There's just something. That Did the court to... even cite Plessy? No. That is so significant. Can you imagine in a discrimination case, six years after friggin' Plessy, this huge case, the court doesn't cite it, right? That's a big deal. I think you have to read Harlan's opinion here as trying to do the least amount of damage possible. Right? Decide this on a very narrow ground, something that doesn't really affect anything else, without expanding Plessy. Because you can imagine a different opinion was written. It would go something like this. The Constitution does not require equal accommodations for school. Right? For a common carrier in a railroad car, if you already have one car, you can certainly have another one. But for schools, that's a matter of local concern, and the Constitution has no control over it. Could you imagine that opinion being written? Mm -hmm. Very easily. 
And what would that opinion have done? That would have made it basically not only constitutional to have separate schools, but to have no schools for black children. So, me, right? The way I read Harlan here is he's doing the least damage possible. That's why he had a unanimous majority decision where no one dissented. Okay? So, you know, it's not, not necessarily a good case, but if you read it between the lines, he's basically saying, they can't do this, but I'm not going to stop them. And that becomes kind of the, uh, the mantra of the Supreme Court in the next few cases. This is probably bad, but we can't stop them. Everyone okay with that? Okay. All right, Blake, what happened in the, in the, the Giles case? Uh, Next one. Basically, there was a couple of decisions submitted to uh, Alabama State Constitution that when you put them together, they um, oui. submitted the blacks and began to vote. Mm -hmm. um, and the guy at Jackson Giles um, was suing, suing that, or suing on behalf of that, on behalf of uh, 5,000 or so other people in Montgomery uh, for the right to make the state allow them to register. Exactly. Okay, so 15th Amendment, right? It says that uh, you cannot deny the vote based on race. And presumably all of the southern states after the ratification of the 15th Amendment had to pass laws permitting people to vote regardless of race. So they got creative, right? They found all these other ways of making it impossible for blacks to vote. And this was for practical reasons. If blacks can't vote, all the people in the state legislatures will be segregationists, right? This wasn't just a means to subjugate them. This had real political concerns. They couldn't send people to Congress who would favor them, right? They couldn't send people to Washington. Um, uh, the, the Democratic Party had effectively a 100-year stranglehold on the South. I mean, we don't think about this today, but the Democratic Party was a party of segregation, and they, they had a virtual monopoly because the slaves, who, uh, freedmen who are all Republicans, couldn't vote. It's uh, funny things, things change around today a little bit. But they tried to make this tough. So they had these two provisions added, right? If you register to vote after, what was this, 1903, mm -hmm. you need to be able to read and write any article of the Constitution in English. You need to have a job of some sort. And you need to own property, right? This would have effectively disqualified a lot of poor people, both white and black. But don't for a second, think this law is applied equally, right? If you were a poor white person who was illiterate and you walked into the precinct, they'd register you. If you were a black person of means who couldn't recite the entirety of the 14th Amendment, I can't, right? Then you can't vote. Have you ever actually seen these literacy tests? They're impossible. Just Google them. I, I, I've tried taking them. I couldn't vote. They're really, really hard. I mean, they ask these questions about American history that I don't even know about. And then I think some of them have no actual, no actual answers. Like, they have these math puzzles. I think the actual correct answer is there's no answer. I mean, they're, they're really hard. Okay. So Giles went to go register to vote before this deadline. Um, and he was suing because he wanted to vote in some upcoming election. Okay. Now, let's be very precise about this one. So, uh, Mike, was Mr. Giles here suing to say that this law, this, this, this new voting scheme was unconstitutional? No, not kind of. Is he suing to say that this law violates the 14th Amendment? No? Well, the answer is no, but not for that reason. What, what okay? What relief was he seeking? Ask, ask this for for. for uh, yes, yes, exactly. He wasn't seeking a declaration that this law is unconstitutional. He was seeking what we call an equity, an injunction. Everyone knows what an injunction is. An injunction is a court order telling government you have to do X, right? Like when when poor Judge Marbury sued to get a stupid commission, he's ordering the president to give him his you know give him his piece of paper, right? There was no challenge to the constitutionality of the Alabama voting scheme. Again, he wasn't stupid. He knew that at this time, like the case before, he can't have plenty 
challenge, because it would bring Plessy straight into the issue, actually be Plessy and the 15th Amendment. And he didn't want to do that. They, these they were very deliberate civil rights lawyers. Okay? So instead, he said, hey, I want the court in equity. What do you mean by equity? Like fairness, right? As a matter of fairness, I want the court to order to put me and uh, other similarly situated uh, black men, no women, just, just just black men at the time, onto the voting rolls. We got that. His remedy was to be put onto the voting rolls. He wanted to order court order to register him to vote. By the way, this is an opinion by Justice Holmes, who I've mentioned several times before. Justice Oliver Wendell Holmes, um, uh, and uh, he, he's known as one of the great judges, but this is not one of his better opinions. Um, what does what does Justice Holmes do here, uh, uh, Shannon? Good. So you just gave away a very important part of the opinion. What does Holmes think about the statute? Does Holmes think it's unconstitutional? No, does, does he think it personally, you think? Well, you just said the answer. I think you did. Why? Oh, don't, if you don't, you know, don't say Jana. Why do you think Holmes believes in his heart of hearts that this law is unconstitutional? Why, why do you say that? Uh, How does he speak of the law? What does he keep calling it? What's that word he keeps using? Sarah, what's the word he keeps using to describe the Alabama law? Uh, he says it's a, law from a fraud. <laughs> he keeps calling it a fraud. Did everyone notice that? He keeps several times it's a fraud. It's a fraud. It's a fraud. Sarah, do you think he thinks this is a valid law? Of course not. It's funny. He almost assumed that this law is unconstitutional. He assumed it was a fraud. He didn't explain why, but he kept calling it a fraud. So he obviously, and this is Holmes, uh, this is Holmes at his worst, right? Of course he thinks the law is unconstitutional, right? But he does not strike it down. Sarah, why doesn't he strike it down? What, what's, what's stopping him? Um. I guess he was saying that if the whole plan of the voter registration was, uh, if, if it was wrong, then he would say that it's not uh, Right. Okay. He's basically saying that I'm not going to force someone to go onto this illegitimate program. Mm -hmm. Right? Right? Holmes had this quote, and I swear he said this. If my fellow citizens want to go to hell, I will help them. He, he believed that fervently. I'll say again. If my fellow citizens want to go to hell, I will help them. Holmes was a majoritarian, or what might be populist now, right? He firmly believed that in almost all spheres, majority will should control and the courts are not getting in the way. There's a few exceptions to the First Amendment, but by and large, he was a very big majoritarian. And this is exactly what he's doing here. He's laying he's flying this fellow citizen. Right, as a result of this citizen, as a result of this opinion, blacks were disenfranchised in the next 60 years. Right? This was just the start. You had literacy tests, you had poll taxes, you had grandfather clauses, all these various mechanisms which were put into place to prevent blacks from voting. So, I mean, on the one hand, I think the opinion has some, some, some appeal. It's like, listen, this entire scheme is illegitimate. I'm not going to order people to put on a legitimate scheme. Yet, he leaves it in place for everyone else. And after 1903, right, no one's going to be able to register to vote. So instead of striking it down, okay? So, uh, Susan, there's one other practical problem that Justice Holmes identifies. What's his practical difficulty? Right. Exactly. So Holmes also says there's a practical difficulty here. How are the judges going to supervise to make sure that every low county registrar actually gives a voting card to a person who comes in? Right? 
the courts don't have armed guards to escort black men into the county registrar office. They don't have those. Holmes basically says, we can't do anything here. We're helpless. He says, this is for the political branches to fix. He recognizes very clearly that even if the Supreme Court ordered that uh, Alabama must give the uh, vote to, to, the free, to the blacks, they're going to ignore it. And they're probably going to kill a lot of people in the process. Anyone who tries going to an office will lynch. I, so Holmes says, we can't do it. Not, not, not us. We can't, we can't do anything here. Contrast this, please, if you will, with Brown, especially Brown number two, where the court has all these elaborate proceedings of how judges will effectively monitor education policy in the United States. So in 50 years, Holmes said, I can't help this guy go to vote, versus we're going to have a court decide issues like busing, integration, and zoning of school maps. It, it's remarkable the progress, if you want to use that word, or the transition from what the Holmes court said to what, Brand, uh, to what the Brown court said. All right, any questions in the Holmes majority opinion? This is, this is just Holmes at his usual self. We'll do some more cases of them later where we upheld an order to require incompetent people to be sterilized because that's what the majority wanted, Buck v. Bell. Poor, poor Carrie Buck, she was declared incompetent and was forcibly sterilized. There's no evidence she was actually incompetent or, or retarded. There's, there's no evidence, but, but Holmes upheld it. Yes? I don't understand this part about the deadline. There's a deadline. If they couldn't get past the deadline, then they weren't ever going to be able to vote. Basically, if you register to vote after this deadline, you had to now have the literacy test. You had to write out the Constitution. That deadline, that requirement didn't impo uh, apply before 1903. And if you were registered before 1903, you kept your registration for life. So that kept all the white people voting indefinitely. All right. Evan, what does... Oh, they don't include the Harlan descent. Okay, so the Harlan descent, unfortunately, was omitted, so I won't, I'll won't. i call you the next one. The Harlan descent was, was blistering here. He says, first of all, the court has jurisdiction to hear the case. This is stupid, right? There's nothing stopping us. If we find a law that's unconstitutional, we can strike it down. He then says, the plaintiff is, quote, entitled to relief in respect of his right to be registered as a voter. He says, this is a clear violation of the Constitution. Clear. Actually, is it entirely clear? Well, on its face, no, because it says nothing about race. It has all these literacy requirements and property ownership requirements. But if you look at the purpose of the law, the intent, it's very clear they're trying to disenfranchise blacks. There's no, there's no doubt about this. By the way, about the ladies, can, can any ladies vote this time? Nope. Suffrage still going on. 19th Amendment was still another uh, maybe 20 years off. <laughs> so, yep, the court upheld this. All right, any questions on the uh, on that case? All right, now Evan, tell me what happened in the Berea College case. But more than that, what else did the law? What else did the law say? And you get this in the Harlan dissent. What else did the law impose on? Who would have to pay the fines? Yes. Okay. So if you notice, the majority only gives you part of the statute. Holmes gives you the entire one. Uh, Holmes. Harlan gives you the entire statute. So the law, on its face, at first blush makes it unlawful for any, quote, person, corporation, or association where any education is received, right, to receive both white and Negro races. But it doesn't only apply to schools that are incorporated under the state law. It applies to persons. And as Justice Harlan points out in his dissent, it also says that individual instructors, teachers, are liable to pay these fines. Not only that, students who attend an integrated school will be fined. This isn't just a requirement that incorporated schools have to be segregated. 
This is a flat out ban on any kind of integrated education. Flat out ban, public or private. Berea College, but you've maybe never heard of it. I wasn't too far from where I used to work. It was a Christian college, right? And it was a very progressive Christian college that, that sought out interracial classes. And it actually still exists today. It's a primarily uh, not quite a historically black college, but pretty much. And they reach out to very poor people in Kentucky, teach them like various uh, uh, technical skills to train them to actually have jobs. It's a, it's a very important school. Um, they have this, this, this great legacy, too. So the law itself Impl uh, impacted not only corporations but individuals. Okay, and what happened here was that Berea College, a corporation under the laws of the state, was actually indicted for a crime and found guilty of a crime in order to pay a fine. Who here knew that a corporation could be found guilty of a crime? Does that surprise some of you? Do you think about it? So all this hubbub about Citizens United and corporate personhood and corporations shouldn't have rights. Well, this is not new. The, uh, Citizens United was one of those overblown cases ever, right? It's nothing new that corporations can have personhood for purposes of crimes and rights. This is nothing new. Corporations just people speaking together with a collective volume that's louder. They organize under the forms of a state to amplify their volume. Anyway, it's, it's an overblown case. But here, 100 years ago, a corporation was just indicted and charged with a crime for serving uh, black and white students. Right? So, uh, 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 Dylan... How did the court resolve this case? What was the court's path to resolving this issue? Well, they kind of understood that, they, that this law was not applicable to individuals, so they kind of ignored that. What do, you, what do you mean they understood that? Why, why do you say that? Because the, um, well, the 14th Amendment says evil to not make a uh, laws like that against foreign individuals. Did the court here really go down the 14th Amendment route and the Plessy route? No. What, why not? Why didn't they do that? How did they avoid that issue here? Um, I'm not sure. Chris? Well, I think that they said that corporations aren't keeping the corporation plot You're really close. Say that again. They didn't say, say they didn't say that corporations are people. In fact, they said that they can be charged as people. Okay. Why did the court not need to resolve? You know, I mean, the statute so applied to persons and corporations, right? Do they consider at all how it applies to persons? Well, no, I think they just said that corporations can be Okay, that that that's pretty close. So everyone knows when you are a corporation, right, and you register with the state, you have to play by certain rules. There's a whole host of rules that apply to corporations that do not apply to an individual. And the reason why is you are seeking some sort of protection from the state. When you incorporate the various immunities and liabilities and different things you get from the state. But as a payment for that, you have to do stuff. You have to follow rules. You have to follow various disclosures. You have to pay taxes. There's an, there's an entire new corporate entity, it's a person, formed as a result of this. So the statute at issue applies to corporations and persons alike. It applies to both. The prosecution in this case, though, was only for the corporation, right? Individuals were not fined. They didn't find any students for going to a black and white school. They could have, but they didn't. What the Supreme Court here was they pretended that the rest of the statute wasn't there. They said the only part of the statute we need to consider is a provision concerning corporations. We will not consider private individuals being fined for going to an uh, integrated school. Right? So all they're considering there is whether a corporation, as a condition of getting the, you know, the corporate status, can be forced to be segregated. Right? Clay, why do they take such a narrow approach to this case? 
time period and the implications of the the rise of the of the body to the market? What would have happened if they would have tried to say that individuals uh, were implicated here? What would, what would that have resulted in? Could they have upheld that, that a black and white person can't learn together in a Sunday school, for example? Could, what, what would have happened if the court would have said that, that the state can't require churches to be segregated? The church? Yeah. Let's say there was a Sunday school, right? And the Sunday school admitted both blacks and whites. Well, could, could Congress have done that? I and mean, could the state have done that? Could the state have fined a church under the statute for admitting blacks and whites in the same Sunday school classroom? What do you think? Not sure. I guess so. The answer is yes. Right? The answer is yes. This statute is very broad. It doesn't apply only to corporations. It applies to any integrated facility where there's learning going on. So the court takes this in a very narrow way. Okay, uh, let's see, uh, Travis, sir, tell me how does the court resolve this issue with respect to the corporations? What do they say? Ha had had they resolve it with respect to the corporations? Was this permissible? Why? Do you got it? If you don't got it, just tell me. There's no point just sitting around. Okay. Uh, uh, Tyler? No, I'm uh, Jonathan. You, how did the court resolve it with respect to the corporations? Why were they? Why could this? Why was this law permissible? I'm not sure. Okay, Michael. No, who are you? Aaron? Yes. Yeah. No, I'm not sure either. Um, I think it said that, um, <clears throat> excuse me, um, that it doesn't, it says something about it prohibits a person. So I get, if I have a guess, I'd say it says something, it designates people instead of corporations. No, what, what do you think? No. This is uh, Caroline, she's not. Yeah, I didn't think so. <laughs> Hi. Just, okay. <laughs> yeah, I, didn't, I didn't think you were in the class. <laughs> All right. <In> the, <laughs> that popular, huh? Yeah, in the back. <laughs> no, I'm calling on you. <laughs> How does the court resolve to respect the corporations? <laughs> Basically, yes. That, 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 that's it. They avoid entirely the equal protection issue. They say corporations can be regulated almost entirely by the state, and this is just another corporation, and this is just another regulation of corporations. Right? This is no different than telling a corporation that they have to have, you know, certain health safety standards, right? You know, make sure that the windows have to be open during the day, you know, there can't be any fire hazards, can't be black people, you know, stuff like this. This is <laughs> <laughs> this is totally what, I mean, that's what the court says. This is just another health and safety regulation for the state. Right? All right, so, uh, Robert, what does, what does uh, Justice Harlan say, then, in, in his dissenting opinion, which was, he, he was from Kentucky. He lives not too far from this, from this university, so I'm sure he was very familiar with this. What, what does he say in his dissent? Uh, basically, that if you apply to corporations, it's the law, uh, so that it applies to uh, the right to assemble Okay, good. All right, so Harlan has a very wide-ranging dissent. He begins by saying, look, look at this full statute. This isn't simply punishing corporations. This is punishing individuals' teachers and individual students, right? We have this college which is founded with the mission of Christ, which is the mission of inclusion and for, for, for promoting education, okay? The state does not have the power to do this. And his answer is actually fairly interesting, right? He doesn't base this only on equal protection. Yeah, my guy Harlan they admitted it. I'm sorry they admitted it. Yeah, he doesn't base this only on equal protection. He speaks in terms of liberty. 
and you'll get this sense of Harlan's opinions. Okay, and what is this liberty interest? Well, in particular, it's a liberty interest in educating, right? In choosing how your children will be educated, that this is a constitutional right the state can't deprive you of. That when we speak of the Fourteenth Amendment, it says. Nor shall any state deprive a person of life, liberty, or property. What what does liberty mean? What's this conception of liberty? Okay, we'll spend an entire unit on this. But this is one of the earliest cases that gives substance or meaning to the word liberty. Right? There's what some people call substantive due process, which I don't like as a phrase, but it's giving some sort of meaning to the word liberty, substance. And what does it include here? The right to decide how your children are educated. The right to pursue an education. That is something which he says comes from the Almighty. Right? The Almighty, God, gives us this issue. He says, the capacity to impart instruction to others is given by the Almighty for beneficent purposes, and its use may not be forbidden or interfered with by government. Certainly, in this case, okay, the right to impart instruction is beyond question. Part of one's liberty as guaranteed by the 14th by the Constitution. Okay? Harlan says we need to decide this question directly. He says, in my judgment, the court should directly meet and decide the broad question. He is sick and tired of ducking around these issues. He's sick and tired of dumping this issue based on, oh, they only challenge part of the statute, and oh, it's only the taxing issue, oh, you know, they're not challenging the uh, in inequity, right? He says we need to confront this issue. This is right in his backyard. He knows Kentucky. He was a Kentucky colonel, among other things. You know, Colonel Sanders wasn't actually a colonel in the military. Kentucky colonel is an honorific. It's a title given by, by the Commonwealth of Kentucky. No people who've gotten it. In fact, in Louisville, there's actually this dude who looks just like Colonel Sanders, and he goes around and takes pictures with you. It's, it's kind of cool. Oh, even better. Do you know that Colonel Sanders got screwed? So when he sold KFC, he didn't believe in banks, so he took cash instead of stock. So the amount of, instead of getting equity in the company he sold, he basically got cash. And with that transaction, he sold the, the likeness of his image. So in other words, the company could use the Colonel Sanders image, and he couldn't. And he actually tried creating a competitor to KFC with his own image, and they shut him down. So the Colonel Sanders was not a good businessman. He knew chicken, but but not not, not business. <laughs> yeah. Um, Colonel Sanders? No. <laughs> yeah. Mm -hmm. Ten years elapsed? I think ten years elapsed, and it's remarkable in those ten years from Plessy to the Brea case how much stuff changed for the bad. And I think Harlan probably got fed up. He's like, we got we got we got duck, we have to hit this issue hard. And he was again, he was the only dissenter. He had a couple of these similar cases. And to answer the question that does this overall coming since closing schools and invoke liberty, Harlan wrote the dissent. Right? So so this doesn't do anything. Cummings was still good law. Yeah. Well, uh, I noticed, you know, Harlan pointed out that the, ti the title of the act, you know, basically to yes. look at the intent. I mean, why is that not something the majority cares about? They, 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 they close their eyes. Not like that horses have blinders, yeah. right, to not see the side. The judges put blinders on. They did not want to confront the entire statute for reasons that I'll, I'll keep showing you this picture. No, not that one. This one. They didn't want that, right? They did not want to have armed insurrection in the South. It, it, it's, it's, you know, if you ever think about why did the courts not do it, just look at that picture, and I'll give you your answer pretty quick. And this was 60 years later, 50, or 50 years later. What else? So Harlan, interestingly enough, doesn't ground this in equal protection, right? He's not trying to challenge Plessy. Like, of course he doesn't agree with it. But he's trying to ground this in a liberty interest of education. And this was something of a, of a burgeoning field, the idea that there's certain liberty interests protected by the Constitution that the state cannot violate arbitrarily. Okay? And he even brings in the, the uh, freedom of religion issue. He says, what if, what if you have a Sunday school, right, or, or, or a, a Sabbath school, as he calls it, and you have an integrated church? 
Are you actually telling a church that they can't worship God and study about the Lord in the way they see fit? Is that what they're actually telling you? Harlan, I, I think I mentioned before, he taught constitutional law at George Washington University. And he, on Saturday nights, he taught Saturday night classes. And what he did Sunday morning? Sunday school teacher. He taught, I think it was a Presbyterian church. Uh, but he taught at a Presbyterian church somewhere in Maryland. So he was a Sunday school teacher. He was speaking from experience here, right? He understood the value. And if you actually read his lecture notes, which I hope you do, on, you can see them on my site, he has these great references to God and providence. Like he was a very spiritual man. So this, this, I think this hit really close hold home to him. Okay? But even so, think about it on this level. A lot of the civil rights laws said that private businesses were allowed to discriminate. It gave them that choice. This law said they're required to discriminate. Everyone see the difference there? Not only you're allowed to discriminate without any kind of civil liability, here you are required to discriminate. You have to discriminate. And if you don't discriminate, we'll hit you with massive fines to shut down your business. And if you're an individual student who wants to go to this church, I'm sorry, this school, you can't go there else you'll be fined. This was a totally different law. So maybe to go back to Shelby's question before, this takes it to a whole other level. This is actually requiring private institutions to be discriminatory versus allowing government to discriminate. And there's, there's, a, there's a big difference there. He says this, I love this phrase, this, this is inoculated with the prejudice of race. And applies uh, all over the place. All right. So as a result of this opinion, what happened? So does everyone know what the concept of historically black university and colleges? Everyone just know what that is? Because of laws like that through the South, which effectively, this Kentucky was not by itself. Other states in quick succession passed similar laws. Schools and universities had to open up black colleges for black people. Um, these still exist today, a Spe a Spelman and Morehouse and others. We have one right here in Houston, Texas Southern. Does anyone know why Texas Southern is a law school? Does anyone know this history? Didn't they have to have a law school in Texas because there's no other ones for them to go to? Mm -hmm. So UT Austin, anyone from UT Austin went there? UT Austin would not admit black students. They wouldn't. They were actually challenged in court. And as a way to get around the law, they said, oh, we have an idea. Rather than desegregate UT Austin, we'll open up another law school in Houston at Texas Southern. The reason why Texas Southern is a law school was because UT Austin didn't want to integrate. Didn't know that, did you? It's actually named now the Thurgood Marshall School of Law after Thurgood Marshall was one of the, the lead lawyers, uh, uh, that's him right there, for the NAACP, NAACP Legal Defense Fund. So the reason why UT Austin has separate law schools, I'm sorry, why Texas had these two law schools was because of discrimination. Forget about that. There's actually another case called Sweat v. Painter where actually a challenge was brought saying that um, uh, this was separate but unequal. In other words, that UT Austin was a very good law school and Texas Southern wasn't. Um, and the Supreme Court actually agreed and they said that you can't have discrimination. Right? So for many years, Texas said all the black kids go to Texas Southern and all the white kids go to UT Austin. And the Supreme Court said in Sweepy Painter, that's not permissible. You can't have these separate facilities, which were not considered equal. That was like a 1948 or 49 case, not, not that long ago. All right. Any more questions on um, the on this? One other issue raised in your notes, which you might have read about, is Bob Jones University. Has anyone ever heard of Bob Jones? What do you know about Bob Jones? Okay. They, maybe they do that now. What, what are they most famous for, Bob Jones? Yeah. So until the 1980s, interracial dating was banned, right? So for a very long time, they didn't admit black students. But then after that, they uh, would not permit interracial dating on campus. It was a, it was a very Christian university. And the, you want to know what happened? The IRS actually revoked their tax-exempt status. They revoked their tax-exempt status. 
because of this racial discriminatory practice. And they effectively argue saying, hey, listen, we can choose to decide how we run our own institution. The Supreme Court said, not that much. Okay? Uh, a couple other cases mentioned, one of the insular cases, right? These were a series of cases discussing U.S. territories, for example, um, uh, Puerto Rico, um, the Philippines, uh, Guam, all these various places acquired through other conquests of the United States. And what are people born in those territories? Are they citizens? Well, the 14th Amendment says all persons born or naturalized will be citizens. Bizarrely, in the insular case, the Supreme Court said people born in Guam and American Samoa are not citizens by birth. And want to know something? That's still good law. If you're born in American Samoa today, your passport says non-citizen. Actually, says like national, something, some fake name for it. There's actually a case right now which I'm working on to get the insult cases overturned. Because this can't possibly be right that a person born in a U.S. territory is not a citizen. And they haven't reversed this case for 100 years. Puerto Rico is by statute, though. See, with Puerto Rico, they're actually given citizenship by statute. It's not actually the 14th Amendment which is interesting. American Samoa does have that same statute. Okay? And uh, uh, just in case you're curious, uh, Native Americans, they were not either covered by the uh, uh, 14th Amendment. They were, not, they were not citizens by birth, but they were given citizenship by statute later, not by the Constitution. All right. Any questions on the cases leading up to it? Okay. So let's do let's do Brown. Um, the the path to Brown is almost as important as the case itself because the case is fairly underwhelming, which is the only word I can think of using. Um, the the lead group pushing this was the um, NAACP. It's a National Association for the Advancement of Colored People, a legal defense fund, the LDF, and this was a group that had a very deliberate strategy of how to combat segregation in the United States. It was a very, uh, a, a very strict plan of how to get this done. And they had a number of smaller cases, like the Sweatby Painter case and others. But their main one was actually going to be a series of challenges to school segregation orders. And these were cases brought all throughout the country. Now, everyone knows that Brown, but there were actually several other cases. So this is actually Linda Brown. Um, her father was a welder. Um, in Topeka, Kansas, and uh, she lived a few blocks away from Sumner Elementary School. Yeah, this, this is Sumner, uh, where is it? Sumner Elementary School. But she was, because she was black, she was assigned to uh, uh, Monroe Elementary School, which was about a mile away, so she had to take a bus, okay? And she had to walk through this long area. Linda Brown was, uh, this is actually her family, this is her dad. Uh, there's this great interview on PBS you can watch online where she discusses the time where her father took her to the uh, white school to get registered. And uh, you know, he sat her down in the office. She was sitting there waiting. And he walks into the principal's office. And she couldn't hear what's happening, but she had there were a lot of screaming and yelling going on. And uh, the father's up. She took her by the hand and said, all right, we're going now. Let's go. And he just ran out. And she like, those, those stairs felt like forever. Um, and it's, it's a deliberate act, right? So this is a question for any of you. Why did they go to school to get denied? What were they trying to do there? They were trying to give them standing. Standing. Remember that? Remember injury in fact? Linda Brown was injured because she was denied admission to the white school. There are so many cases that require you trying to go get something you know you're not going to get. Uh, District of Columbia versus Heller, the big gun case, Second Amendment case. Dick Heller, why did he have standing? He went to go obtain a gun permit knowing he couldn't get one. They denied it to him. Okay, he had a denial. That, that gives him standing. So Linda Brown was one of them in Topeka, Kansas. This is an awesome picture from Life magazine. Um, these are all the plaintiffs from the various cases. Uh, I think the last one died like a couple years ago, like fairly recently. They're all in their 90s by this point. Uh, so there were cases from South Carolina, Virginia, Delaware. You don't think of Delaware as a segregated state, do you? It was. Delaware and Washington, D.C. So this is a, a let's see. I think the captions are wrong. Okay, so Vicki Henderson, Donald Henderson, Linda Brown, James Emanuel, Nancy Todd, and Catherine Carper. 
and here are them just standing up and so, remember like when you're in school you in, in size order remember that I, I guess you're doing size order kind of cute um, there's one other plaintiff who we'll talk about in a few minutes this is uh, uh, Spotswood that's a great name Spotswood Thomas Bowling um, and he was a high school student in Washington DC all right so let's walk through this case. This is actually Monroe Elementary. If any of you take like I-10 East, like all the way, no, actually not I-10, which highway is it? But whatever highway it runs through um, uh, Topeka passes by the school pretty close, so you'll see it. Uh, this is the school. It's actually a National Historical Site. You actually see the sign saying white and colored because uh, it's a segregated school. Uh, this is actually a photograph, not from Linda Brown's year, but from 1946 or seven. I can't read it. Of the class, you can see it's actually uh, the classroom itself was was actually um, uh, looks looks can't quite tell. Anyway, that's the class itself. Uh, this is another photograph of the class where she taught. This is the white high school that uh, they she'd want to go to. Okay. All right. So let's actually talk about the case itself. the The procedural posture of the case. Is a mess. Let me answer this question. So, because they wanted to, they didn't want armed insurrection. They avoided interpreting the Constitution correctly. We like to say they avoided the issue, right? The avoidance doctrine. This is a thing, right? Sometimes in the history of our court, judges have avoided reaching a constitutional issue to avoid striking down law. Obamacare. Yeah. It happens. Judges will avoid striking down decisions they think might be either unpopular or not received well, or they might harm the legitimacy of the court. This is a very deep topic, but I think you have to look at the cases from the early 20th century. These judges weren't stupid, right? They knew what was going on. They knew these people were being deprived of the right to vote, the right to go to school, but they felt boxed in, constrained. Okay, so the cases were from all over. They were from South Carolina, Virginia, Delaware, and Washington, D.C. The case was first argued to the Supreme Court in the spring of 1953. And you want to know what? The court wasn't able to reach a decision. Imagine that. Why were they not able to reach a decision? Because they insisted on having a unanimous opinion. The justice felt having this come out 5-4 would be devastating because it would basically mean that half, roughly half the court thinks this is wrong. And this would give a green light to the South to just ignore it. So what did they do? They decided to re-argue the case. This happens once in a blue moon. In fact, do you want to know a case was re-argued? Citizens United. This case was re-argued a few months later to consider broader issues. So the case was re-argued, but then something, you know, fateful perhaps happened. The Chief Justice at the time was Fred Vinson. He was in favor of upholding these laws. He didn't want to strike them down. Okay? Fred Vinson died. Earl Warren, the new Chief Justice, replaced him. In fact, he was a recess appointment by, by President Eisenhower. By installing a new Chief Justice, the fate of history in this case was changed. Earl Warren was a very popular governor from California, and he really had not much judicial uh, 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 background. He didn't really have much in the way of, uh, uh, you know, legal experience too much. But he was a politician, and what do politicians do? They build consensus, right? They get people to agree to stuff. The, the result, you know, the way you get there doesn't much matter. It's the results that count. So Earl Warren said, "We need to have this case argued again." Okay. And Earl Warren insisted on having this case come out unanimously. Okay. And there's a couple memos here that, that might be interesting for you to look at later. But he wanted to make sure that every justice agreed. So Earl Warren circulated countless drafts to each of the nine justices and said, do you like this? Do you like this? Let's keep it like this. This is why the opinion is so short and says so little. The easiest way to get people to agree to stuff is by having the fewest number of edits, right? 
if the opinion is really short, there's not much people to disagree with. Because what happened was you had a couple of justices who wanted to overrule Plessy versus Ferguson. Overrule it, flat out. You had a couple of judges who thought that this policy was unconstitutional, but it should be limited to public education. And you had maybe one or, or two judges who thought, we should let the states decide this issue. So all those various dynamics came to play with the final opinion. Why? Did the court overrule Plessy? No. Did the court expand beyond public education? No. Did the courts order the states to do stuff? No. This is like the most compromised opinion ever. The most famous opinion which you've all heard of and studied in every grade level, right? You talk about it every, every, every year. Didn't really do much. It did very little. And not only did it do little, Dr. No, Dr. Doolittle, it, it, it didn't do much. It set up 25 years more of litigation to actually get to integrated schools. And it took almost that long. All right, so here's some more photographs. Yeah, it's actually funny. Um, kind of an aside. John W. Davis, right? You probably don't know the name. I do, because he was a guy who actually argued that the segregation scheme in the schools was constitutional. And it's always a deep question of if you can separate the lawyer from the cause, right? If you're a lawyer arguing on behalf of segregation, how are you going to be remembered by history? That guy. And, and a similar analog today, and I'm not, not comparing the two, but I've done it in another context, is the lawyer is willing to argue that bans on gay marriage should be upheld. And I, I, have, I don't necessarily agree with this, but I have a sinking feeling that in 20, 30 years when people study con law and they read about the lawyers who actually argued in favor of uh, uh, bans on gay marriage, that they'll be mentioned the same breaths as John W. Davis. Uh, you can maybe check back in the 20 years, but I have a, I have a feeling that's actually plausible. I, I've written about this, and uh, it, it's, I don't know how I feel about this because we always try and separate the lawyer from the cause. You, even, everyone knows this is John Adams defended the members of the Boston Massacre. John Adams defended the Redcoats who shot you, at, at Americans, right? Uh, we actually just had a, a civil rights nominee last week, a guy named Debo Agabile, uh, who defended Mumia uh, Al-Jabbar, who was a cop killer. And uh, he was voted down by the Senate for a civil rights position because he defended a cop killer. He didn't actually defend him. He, he authorized some briefs in, his, in support of him. But how do we separate the lawyer from the cause, right? Do you take on cases you don't believe in? Now, in this case, I, I researched this. Almost all the lawyers agreed with the cause, but not all of them did. Some of them were government lawyers who, that was their job. They had to defend the law, whether they agreed with it or not. That doesn't apply today so much. If you don't like the law, you just don't defend it. But, but at least back then, if the law is in the books, you would defend it. To give it a vigorous defense. So here is the arguments. Okay, here's actually this um, uh, a draft opinion of Earl Warren's uh, decision, and you can see here he wrote unanimously. Right, that word never made it to the opinion. In other words, he proposed that as an edit, but no one accepted it. Even putting the word unanimously in there was too much for the judges. It would, it would break the compromise. Right. Uh, and this other thing, that we decided Bowling versus Sharp. We'll get to Bowling versus Sharp in a couple minutes. Any other pictures? This is a note from Felix Frankfurter to the Chief Justice. Uh, and it says, this is a day that will live in glory. It's also a great uh, day in the history of the court. And uh, something, and not in the least, for the cost of deliberations which brought about the result. Right, so Frankfurter is saying we should be praising the deliberation that got its result. The actual reasoning is, is almost ancillary. Okay. Here's a photograph of Thurgood Marshall. Uh, this is uh, George Hayes and uh, James uh, uh, Napper. These were the head lawyers at the NAACP. Uh, this is an iconic photograph of them celebrating on the courthouse steps. Uh, here's the entire legal defense team. This, this is an awesome photo. I think you've maybe you've probably seen this before. This is Linda Brown sitting on the courthouse steps with her mom with a photograph of the newspaper. It says, High Court Banned Segregation in Public Schools which is a kind of a really cool photo. Um, today, this photo can't happen. You're not allowed to sit in the steps anymore. They, 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 they would actually arrest her for taking this photograph, but I'll, I'll, let, I'll let that one go. Okay, This is actually a newspaper headline from I think, somewhere in Virginia. Um, it says, segregation public schools ended by court. 
But the part I want to draw your attention to is a sub-headline. Ruled unconstitutional by Supreme Court, date and practice not set. Right? There was no date given to end it. This is why I have Brown number two. Okay? Like this is Mr. Sharp and Mr. Bowling, I mean. And I showed you these pictures before, but these were the years following Brown. Right? When they ordered a swimming pool to be desegregated, they filled it with concrete. That you needed armed guards to escort these children into school. And they actually had to have a governor confront a general, I'm sorry, uh, a general confront a governor to desegregate the uh, uh, University of Alabama campus. So the opinion itself was fairly, we, scholars debate about how relevant the opinion was, but the aftermath was, was, was not clean. Yes, ma'am? The state of the schoolhouse door wasn't that staged, though? Well, depends what you think. What do you mean by staged? Well, I mean, I know he, George Wallace, called a bunch of people, a lot of the military men, up, like, and all, that had the news crews there, and then I think, like, after, like, 20 minutes, 30 minutes after they enrolled the two students. He, so, are you from Alabama, or? No, I mean, I wrote my thesis on it. <laughs> so, so there are, there are lots of theatrics. He also ran for president and right. other things. So, there are probably elements of it that were staged, but I think he firmly believed that he needed to show strength against the federal government in this case. I think that that, that consists with your research. What do you think? You're the expert. Um, <laughs> no, sir, I mean, I'm glad to have this. I mean, I think he did a lot just to make people in Alabama happy. And so whether, I mean, I think he did, like you said, you did believe it, but I don't think that, I think that he really liked things about the camera a lot more. Well, what message did what message did it send to principals statewide? Well, in the, in the state, they were all excited. Anyone that was pro segregation was happy with it, but a lot of people didn't know that within that within that hour that two African American students enrolled in the University of Alabama. Yeah, I think I think that's right. I mean, a lot of this was about sending messages to the segregationists, and I think this reinforces it because when you have the governor of the state willing to send the federal troops, whether genuine or not, your your rank and file segregation of the state will be more emboldened. To stand up against desegregation. I think that's a fair generalization. Thank you. Well, what was the topic for your thesis? Just on. Um, I wrote about uh, women, uh, African American women uh, fighting. So I wrote about Ooh. one of the Little Rock Nine. I wrote about authoring loose at at University of Alabama. And just raise your hand now? <laughs> that was just like an hour ago. No, I mean I know. Just... Okay, well thank you. <laughs> See, when you want to point out that I'm wrong, that's when that's when they raise their hand. <laughs> thank yeah, you. That's 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 <laughs> that's, that's, that's probably. That's, I mean. But the staging is deliberate because it sends a very clear message to the rank and file that this is what the policy to the state is, right? When, you go, when you're watching Alabama local news, you don't see that the cameras turn off. You just see what's there. And you see this iconic photograph of Governor Wallace, the segregation, the Dixiecrat he is going for it. Yeah. Dixiecrat, what a, what a name for a party. Anyway, so let's walk through the actual case itself, which which I'm sure you were all surprised at how short it was, right? It's like, you're probably expecting this long thing to read, and it's like, what, like three or four pages? So the court begins by reciting the facts, okay? Then there's, then there's a discussion about history, and the court effectively says that the original understanding of the 14th Amendment is inconclusive. In other words, some people, the radical Republicans, took a very extreme position whereby segregation was not allowed. And there were other people who were the moderates or the Democrats who wanted segregation. Okay? So effectively the court says history gets us nothing. Now, what's interesting, and this is kind of a broader point about the Supreme Court, is that as bizarre as it sounds, the idea of looking to what a provision meant at the time it was enacted, what could be called originalism, didn't really exist until the 1960s, 70s, now 80s, and 90s. That courts were not very much interested in history, which seems so surreal because of the world we live in today where things like the Second Amendment and otherwise. The court's research here was crap, okay? Absolute crap. There have been enough books written on the ratification of the 14th Amendment to fill this entire room where there is lots of history. Now, it might still be inconclusive, right? There are rigorous debates about whether, as the 14th Amendment was understood by its drafters, it would have prohibited private segregation. Okay? 
So the argument against it is that we had the Civil Rights Act of 1875, which, remember, prohibited segregation in all places of public accommodation. It didn't mention schools, but it mentioned hotels, restaurants, etc. So I think there's actually a, a decent argument that those who framed the amendment understood to ban private segregation, right? But the court rejected that in the civil rights cases. Okay. What's the argument against it? At the very time the 14th Amendment was being ratified, the schools in the District of Columbia, where Congress had full control, were segregated. In other words, the very Congress that ratified the 14th Amendment segregated schools. So there, there's a vigorous debate, and, you know, it goes back and forth, and I, I won't even try and take a side here. But there's a, there's a, there's a, a, a rigorous discussion about whether, whether the civil rights cases was correctly decided, right? Could schools segregate under the 14th Amendment? Or as Justice Harlan said, is this a liberty interest that's so broad the state can't violate it in this manner by segregating? The court didn't resolve it on any kind of constitutional grounds like that. Okay, then the court turned to the line of cases, right? And the court made a very astute observation. They said in all of these cases, you know, the Cummings case, the Giles case, the Berea case, none of those cases focused on Plessy, right? None of those cases expanded the doctrine of separate but equal. In fact, they were quite deliberate in not doing so they avoided the issue, okay? So one of the reasons why, to go back to the question posed before, the court avoided this issue was they didn't want to set any more dangerous precedents. If the Supreme Court keeps repeating Plessy, 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 that makes it more real. If they ignore it and don't talk about it, like Bush v. Gore, they can pretend it doesn't exist. It's funny, actually, the Supreme Court said, do not cite Bush v. Gore in anything. They actually said that. Well, they cite it all the time. I was actually in Florida last week. I went to the Florida Supreme Court where Bush v. Gore was decided. It was a very nice Supreme Court. I liked it. It was in Tallahassee. Beautiful reading room. All these really old books from the 1500s, you know, from when Spain owned Florida. Like, these really old books. It was, I'll have them pictures later. Okay. So, the court said in none of these cases from the early 20th century did the, was, was Plessy ever reaffirmed. In fact, in the Sweat v. Painter case, this was a case from UT Austin, the court actually held in the context of grad school, law school, you can't have separate facilities. Anyway, the court has this great line. They say, we can't turn the clock back to 1868 when the amendment was adopted, or even 1896 when Plessy was written. In other words, they're not changing any of the history. They're going to just leave all that there. And they're going to decide this case on very narrow grounds. So most of the opinion actually focuses on the importance of education. It says, we must consider public education in light of its full development and place in American life. Okay. Meanwhile, 50 years earlier, most schools didn't have public, you know, most states didn't have public education, but, but Earl Warren thinks this is the case. He says, education is perhaps the most important function of state and local governments. I think people would probably disagree with this. There are a lot of education provided by the private sector. Uh, uh, I see New York right now. But, but, but you know, the, the uh, Earl Warren has to get there. Okay. He says, education is a very foundation of good citizenship. No child can succeed without education. Okay. So this entire opinion is about education, right? Did you say anything about segregated train cars? No. Anything about segregated hotels? No. Anything about segregated restaurants? No. You know, the Katzenbach case and the Hearts of Atlanta case, those all decided 10 years later on Commerce Clause grounds, actually 15 years later even, all right? So what's the only question here? Does this law deprive a group of minority students an equal educational opportunity? That's a very funny way of stating an equal protection clause violation. He's not saying, does the government's classification based on race violate the Constitution? Right? Someone asked before about Korematsu, right? Well, is he from Korematsu? 
they were excluding the Japanese people based on race. The court in that case said, yeah, they can do it. We have a national interest in security. So we can exclude Japanese people based on their race. Did the court say here that uh, Topeka, Kansas can't exclude based on race? No. The entire opinion was premised on education. And not even just education. It was premised on psychology. And when he was a psych major or just psychology, is psychology a good basis for constitutional law? Yes. <laughs> Wrong answer. What do you think? Why do you say yes? Well, <laughs> but okay. I, I mean, I think that you you can definitely look at the psychological impact that certain law certain laws have on people and mm -hmm. um, see how they basically impact people. Have thinkings in psychology changed over the last sixty years? Um, well, <laughs> the answer is yes. Yeah. Right. What if? What if it was determined that in some contexts, having single racial education was actually more effective in certain contexts? I would uh, question what kind of study. Called ESL, maybe. Right? Putting certain people of certain races together in an ESL class might be more productive to learn English. I would really question the psychometrics behind the study that was done. Uh, okay. I would question the validity of that kind of test. Are these questions which judges be designed constitutional law on? Right? I mean, I thought when I was, when I was on the comment, like, the doll test for Dr. Clark was, I thought that, that they said that that was very powerful in the courtroom when... Can you tell us about that? Um, it's Dr. Kenneth Clark and Mamie, I believe is his wife's name, they did this test where they brought in um, children of, like, African-American race and white race, and they sat them down and they just, like, had two different dolls, and one was white and one was black, and they were saying, you know, which one's prettier, and both the white and the black children were pointing both to the white. Like, which one, who do you want to be like? Um, who's prettier? Who's better? Who, who's smarter? And all these things in these children, like both black and white, were both constantly pointing to the, at the white doll. And so that they were show, trying to show through the study that um, African-American children are very aware that they weren't getting the same kind of education and that in America that they looked, they wanted, they wanted to be white because they needed to be treated better and have better chances. Mm -hmm. So, there, there absolutely were psychological studies. So there's footnote 11 in the opinion, which has been very well, uh, roundly criticized, that the psychological basis on which this opinion was written, at least in 1952, was fairly weak. Okay? Uh, there were certain kind of almost, not quite anecdotal, but just general studies about how people viewed race. But for this to be the basis of constitutional right is difficult. Does that mean in order to strike down a ban on segregated hotels, you need to have a psychological study saying people in hotels might have some sort of impact, right? To have us have a ban on, I don't know, segregated swimming pools, we need to do a psychological study on how people have react to swimming pools. See what I'm getting at, right? This is not a very good basis to do constitutional law because psychological studies are very fraught with controversy. They're often disputed. And my sister is, a, is getting her doctorate in psych now. I mean, I... Uh, you know, these, these things change every few years. These things are very much up in the air. So the Earl Warren opinion was very much um, contested, among other reasons, because it relies on the psychological study so much, which does not lend itself so well to any other context. He says, whatever may have been the extent of psychological knowledge at the time of Plessy versus Ferguson, this finding is amply supported by modern authority. Right, so the reason why we're ignoring Plessy is because of Sigmund Freud. Right? Not because Plessy was wrong, but because of the psychological impact that discrimination has on kids. Okay? Yes? Well, so are you only referring to psychology not really having anything to do with constitutional law um, and the way that it might affect the children that were discriminated against, or because this this makes me think of what we were talking about on Tuesday or on Monday, um, because I was really really um, upset with the way Harlan, I, I loved his dissent um, in the one case, and then when he started talking about the Chinese, I was just like, oh, what's going on? Like everything you just said about the Constitution not being colorblind, and then they said in the case that um, in the footnote they had said um, the way he was viewing Chinese, it was just a part of 
Um, it could, could have been his age, when he was raised, and this and that. And it could, I guess it could be a way that maybe he was groomed by his family or the norms of that time. And I feel like that a lot of that does have to deal with like, your psychological state at the time. And so how, how does that not impact constitutional law? Okay, so uh, the question is, because they said being, he being think wrong. right, so 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 uh, well, you're, so being in a segregated school absolutely reinforces inequality, right? Imagine, I mean, I, I don't think anyone's terms would apply to, but imagine growing up in in, in, a, in a segregated school where you see the blacks using one door and you see the other one, right? That will breed in your mind that they actually are inferior. That that's the doll. That's the doll example you just mentioned. So always seeing people in a different context, what we say is subjugate that puts them separately, right? That's a very bad thing psychologically. But what does a constitution actually prohibit? Does it constitute causing psychological harm to people? Or does it constitute the government making classifications based on race? In other words, they were treating the symptom and not the cause, right? They were prohibiting making these children feel inferior or the underlying evil was a government law premised on discrimination. They didn't touch the law that discriminates. They based all of it on how people feel about education. So you see the difference? Rather than saying straight up, equal protection, that means you can't discriminate based on race. They made this entire rigmarole of how important education is, and because education is important, it makes people feel inferior. Because it makes people feel inferior, it can't comply with the Constitution. Instead of setting a bright line rule that would basically struck down all these different forms of discrimination, they took a very narrow path that it fixes only one thing, public education. That's what they held. They said, we conclude that in the field of public education, the doctrine of separate but equal has no place. Did they say anything about any other context? No. They thought that by doing it through education that those kids would grow up integrated in the that, yeah, yeah. Um, they probably thought that. Yeah, I'm sure, I'm sure. Yeah, I'm sure they said that. They thought that by fixing education, we can we can have a more enlightened society, right? That this was a first step. So the NAACP wasn't stupid, right? They're very smart lawyers. The reason why they started with education because that's something everyone can appeal to. I mean, you always say you have the cute kids, but but these kids are adorable, right? Who who wants to kick these kids out of out of a school, right? Except for probably most of the South, right? But you know, you have very uh, sympathetic plaintiffs. These are children who just want to get an education and grow up to be productive members of our society. They pick this case rather than a hotel case, or rather than a segregated rent restaurant, or a segregated lunch counter. Right? They pick this case on purpose because there was so much knowledge about education and how psychology impacts educational development. Right? There, there was a lot of different bases that can get to the right result here. That's why they started with education. This was a very deliberate action. People don't wear bow ties enough anymore. I, I, I pin tie one, I even know. Anyway, so does that kind of answer your question in, in a roundabout way? Yeah. What the court could have done was say straight up, classifications based on race are unconstitutional. You can't classify based on race. But instead of doing that, they said, we'll limit to education. Now, how do you limit to education? That's where the psychology comes in, right? By making a narrow ruling, they had to have all these other psychological literature to make that ruling work. It wouldn't have worked otherwise. I mean, if they did uh, make it illegal, completely separate but equal, I don't, do you think that it would still be a unanimous decision? The reason? No. And that's exactly right. There were like three, depending on how you count, about three justices want to overrule Plessy. Maybe three. Right, we have all their papers, but we know what they think. We know about all the memos they exchanged. So there are three justices who want to overrule Plessy, but the other six didn't. So this was the narrow compromise they charted. Yeah. You basically just ignore it. Well, they didn't ignore it. What they said was, in the field of public education, the doctrine of separate but equal has no place. What the hell does that mean, right? Well, Plessy doesn't apply for public education. In other words, they, they limited, or actually they carved an exception for Plessy with respect to education. They say, Separate educational facilities are inherently unequal.
right? All they say is that separate educational facilities are unequal. And the reason why they say separate educational facilities are unequal is because of the psychological evidence, right? That's only used to support the conclusion that education facilities are unequal. That psychological evidence in footnote 11 says nothing about segregated restaurants or hotels or lunch counters. That makes sense, everyone? All right. Questions before we move on? All right. So now we have the now what, right? What happens now? The remedies, right? Do we desegregate all the schools? No. All right? Where is it? Just... Okay. We don't desegregate all the schools. What do we do? Well, it's complex. The word they use is complexity. Right? All we focus on in this case, the court says, is the constitutional law. Well, not really. But they focus on the constitutional aspect of it. Okay? We said that segregation denies equal protection. Okay. Now, what next? We need to re-argue the case. We need to have the Attorney General of the United States and the State Attorneys General from, from the South, don't worry, Texas participated, of course they did, to come into court and tell us how we can fix this. So rather than just ordering all the schools to desegregate, they said, come back next year. Let's take another year and think about this. Let's let this digest. So let's have arguments. And that's it. That's how the opinion ends. Is that like the most anticlimactic ending ever? Did anyone get that sense like this just ended here? Okay. Again, they knew stuff like this would happen, right? They knew that if they ordered desegregation, the schools wouldn't listen. Whether, whether staged or not, this kind of antics would happen. Okay. There was another case, which is only a paragraph long, or maybe a page and a half long in your book, gives the case of Bowling versus Sharp. This is, what's his name, Spotswood, yeah, Spotswood Bowling. He went to a public school in the District of Columbia. Okay. Now, I told you that, this, that the court premised their opinion on the Equal Protection Clause of the 14th Amendment, right? The Equal Protection Clause of the 14th Amendment applies to states, right? It says, no state shall make a law, blah, 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 right? No state. Which relevant amendment applies to the federal government? Fifth Amendment. Here's the Fifth Amendment. Take it on your constitution. Whip them out. Ready? Go to page, page 44. All right. Uh, Joaquin, uh, tell me, does the Fifth Amendment which applies to the federal government, right? The first eight amendments apply to the federal government. Is there an equal protection clause in the Fifth Amendment? No. What do you mean, no? I guess there is, like, if the. Is there a guarantee of equal protection of the law in the Fifth Amendment? You were right the first time. The answer is no. <laughs> Don't, I'm not, not a trick question. Okay. It is a trick question for law clerks that year, though. The Supreme Court in Brown made it very clear they decided this on the basis of equal protection. They did not base it on the due process clause, right? They did not base it on some sort of liberty interest. You recall Justice Harlan said that the right to education is actually a, a liberty interest protected by the Constitution. The Brown Court didn't say that. Okay? So what happens here? How does a school in the District of Columbia, which again, D.C. is not a state, it's authorized by the federal government, how does a segregated school in the District of Columbia violate the Equal Protection Clause if the Equal Protection Clause only applies to the federal government? Everyone see the problem here? The Equal Protection Clause does not apply to the federal government. It only applies to the states. This was an afterthought, actually. This is actually almost comical, right? There's actually a memo somewhere in the paper of the justice saying, oh, crap, what about the D.C. case, right? If we just roll in favor of Kansas, this won't desegregate D.C. schools. 
it was almost like a whoopsie, right? <laughs> this was this is literally an after. That's why the opinion is so short. Daniel, what does the court do here? How do they how do they how do they untie this knot? We pretty much say that it's the unfair to hold the federal system to a lower standard. Yeah. Okay. This opinion uh, is bullshit. It is. There is absolutely no way that this is good legal reasoning. And even if you agree with the result, this is it's just it's just it's just crap. Okay. What does the court say? And I, I don't like using foul language, but I have to, but this is, this is an absolutely terrible opinion, which has no legal analysts. Like, if you put this in for your legal writing prior, uh, some you get an F, right? It, it's terrible. They say, and I'll, I'll read it, the concepts of equal protection and due process, both stemming from our American ideal of fairness, are not mutually exclusive. What does that mean? There's no court citations. The equal protection of the law is a more explicit safeguard of prohibited unfairness than due process of law. And therefore, we do not imply that the two are always interchangeable. But, as this court has recognized, discrimination may be so unjustifiable as to be violative of due process. So, what they're actually saying is that discrimination is so bad, it violates a liberty interest protected by the due process clause. Even though five minutes earlier in Brown, they said we do not decide this is a due process case. You're laughing. You should be. This is what has been called reverse incorporation. Right? So the Fifth Amendment, 1791. The Fourteenth Amendment, 1868. Right? So 70 years past. What the courts are actually saying is that the Equal Protection Clause of the Fourteenth Amendment zips back in time and updates the Fifth Amendment. But now the Fifth Amendment has an equal protection component. It's actually called an equal protection component of the Fifth Amendment. And this is why the federal government can't violate equal protection. Even though, look on page 44, there is no equal protection clause in the Fifth Amendment, the liberty interest in the Fifth Amendment is considered to embody equal protection. This is a case that drives common law scholars absolutely nuts because it can't possibly be right. You might make a colorable argument that at the time of the 18th Amendment, I'm sorry, at the times of the 14th Amendment, the framers were against segregation. But are you really going to argue the time of the American Revolution and in 1787 that the founders were in favor of equal protection? It's a very bad argument. You're not going to win that one. So this is a weird sore spot of constitutional law. It's almost like a legal fiction. We have to accept it because, again, it would be unfair, right? It wouldn't make much sense to have the feds have one standard and the states have another. In fact, the courts have held consistently that the federal government and the state government are held to the same standards. I don't even think that's accurate, but that's what the courts have held. Okay. No questions on that? There is some merit in the Brown, I'm sorry, the Bowling opinion. There's a couple merits. So they actually talk about what will become to be known as scrutiny. We've mentioned this in class a few times. Okay? They say that classifications based on race must be scrutinized, must be looked at closely, with particular care, since they are contrary to our traditions and hence constitutionally suspect. So there are two words you've got to take away from that. Scrutiny and suspect. Okay, and we'll talk about these much more. But from this case, more or less, we get the idea of a strict scrutiny test applied to a suspect class. Again, it says, it says classifications based solely on race must be scrutinized with particular care, and they are constitutionally suspect. In other words, any time the government makes a classification or separates people by race, it's suspect. In other words, it's suspicious. This is called a suspect class. Race is a suspect class, okay? as is religion and a few others. We'll talk about that later. If you have a suspect class at issue, the courts will look closely at it. This is what's called strict scrutiny. Mm -hmm.
right? And, and, and the court says, quote, segregation in public education is not reasonably related to any proper governmental objective, right? This is the beginning of a formulation of a strict scrutiny test. We'll do more later. But we have to compare what is the government trying to achieve and what are the means they choose to get there, right? They say, oh, we need to promote school safety, therefore we need to keep the blacks and whites separate. That's their argument. Well, I think you can promote school safety in a more narrow way without segregating based on race. Therefore, that law would fail strict scrutiny. Okay? And it's interesting they put this in the Bowling case, not the Brown case, the case that doesn't really mean anything. Yeah, one professor said this case, it's gibberish, both syntactically and historically. It's not a very good opinion. All right, any questions on the Bowling case? All right. All right, the last case we have is Brown sequel. And again, this is a very odd opinion for you to read because it doesn't really decide anything at all. Okay, what's the purpose of this opinion? They wanted all the state attorneys general to come in and tell them, okay, you tell us, how do we implement this order, right? How do we ensure that the schools are desegregated? And a number of states, Florida, North Carolina, Arkansas, Oklahoma, Maryland, of course, Texas, came to the court. And this entire opinion is like a series of, you know, principles. You know, how do you go about doing this? We need to look to local solutions. But the courts are in the closest position to the, to the uh, cities to decide how best to do this. Right? The effect of this decision was to put most of the southern schools under control of the federal courts. There's no other way of looking at this. You would have these three judge panels which would supervise the school districts for decades. They would appoint special monitors to make sure that the schools are complying. If any schools did not comply, they would issue orders to require them to do stuff. This was a source of a lot of hostility, right? Because what are the different issues that the court said can be monitored? Zoning, you know, wh which schools you zone for? School policies for admission, how do you admit people? Curricular needs, hiring of teachers, school busing, right? This was a big issue in the 70s where you had courts ordering busing of minority students to, uh, uh, to white areas to integrate. Uh, the question today is why was this not an advisory opinion? Um, this entire area of the law doesn't play by their normal rules. They, they, were, they were trying to achieve some great social policy here. Um, and uh, in many respects, I think they achieved it. Uh, though, as I keep showing these pictures, the, they were not achieved without any, without any sort of pushback. Okay? They gave the defendants, I'm sorry, they gave the schools uh, an opportunity to make a reasonable start. But once the start's made, they'll be on a clock. And then the courts will have to decide, you know, if they're complying. They say the court, quote, retains jurisdiction. In other words, the courts will monitor these schools indefinitely. And there are actually still schools today, year 2014, that are still bound by these orders from Brown. There are still school districts today that have integration orders. It still goes on. Okay. So this case, which I'm sure before today you had no negative thoughts of whatsoever, you probably just championed and celebrated, has a lot to criticize. Okay. It was a very momentous case symbolically for what it accomplished, but practically speaking it didn't do much. What actually did the heavy lifting was a bunch of opinions issued by the court per curiam, which means unanimous, I'm sorry, anonymous, there's no name. The court would issue these very simple opinions about, about racquetball clubs and tennis courts and swimming pools, one after another. So this wasn't just limited to public education. Brown by itself is not that big. The legend of Brown has far exceeded what Brown actually held. Right? This image of Brown and repealing Plessy, it, 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 it's a myth. But we have this image, and it's been very important in our collective culture. So I don't mean in any way to, to deny or disparage the opinion, but by reading it now and studying it now for the past two hours, you see how little it did. But this set the stage for when, when things get real, right? When the president, John Kennedy, Lyndon Johnson, pushes for Civil Rights Act. When you have members of both parties, Republicans and Democrats, voting for a Civil Rights Act. The reason why 
Kennedy and Johnson sent troops out to these schools wasn't because of Brown versus Board. It's because they were pushing through civil rights legislation to make this happen. That they had to change the hearts and minds. And, and I think I mentioned this in the Obamacare case. In order for true change to occur, it's not enough for the courts to do something. You need to have the people, the executive, the legislature behind something. We have all branches of government converging on an idea. That's when you achieve change. This was actually brought up in the, in the Plessy majority where they said, listen, we can't legislate racial tolerance from the bench, right? As judges, we can issue the opinion, but this will not cleanse from the heart hatred, right? The, 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 the heart has to change by itself, and that's an often long and painful struggle. And the courts are just but one element in that pursuit. Now, you might say the courts are being activists. They were acting too out of hand. If the courts hadn't done this, would Plessy, I'm sorry, would, would Brown have happened? Would, would the Little Rock Nine have happened, right? Would, would, would the Civil Rights Act have happened? And we don't know. These are counterfactuals. But this was a very tumultuous period in American history where so many things were converging at once. Okay. Any questions? Questions? All right. Yep. I'll see you guys later. Have a good day.